Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this year's Economics of Mutuality virtual debate. Um, before we turn to the motion before us this evening, I want to draw your attention to the forms of the debate. There will be three speakers in proposition and three speakers in opposition, with the first and last speakers giving five minute speeches and the second speakers giving three minute speeches. Debaters may raise points of information at any time between the first and last minutes by saying on that point or on a point of information. These should be factual and less than 30 seconds in length if possible. Speakers may choose to accept or to decline points of information. There will also be an opportunity for audience members to make themselves heard by delivering two minute floor speeches after the first two speakers on each side of the debate. Your attention will be drawn to the opportunity to do this when we get there. Now, before we move to the motion before the house, which is this house believes that within a decade, businesses will be purpose centric or will cease to exist you have the opportunity to share your initial thoughts on the motion with a poll which should be in front of you. Right, well, it seems most of you have voted, thank you, um, with a pretty emphatic opening um, demonstration that you're all in support of the motion. So we'll see whether your perspectives change over the course of the debate. Um, before we begin, I'll remind you that um, the speakers in the debate are not necessarily representing their personal views, they're debating competitively um, for the purposes of this evening, so please don't hold it against them. Um, and with that, I will look to the first speaker in proposition of the motion, Saskia, to open the debate. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, businesses have adapted and changed to fit societal trends over and over again, and will continue to do so in the future. The chances are that your kids have never heard of Blockbuster, and the hope is that their kids will never hear of high-speed algorithmic traders or real estate seminars. Now, whether or not we agree that purpose is essential to the survival of business in the next decade, I think we can all agree that the best businesses out there are always ahead of the curve of society. And right now, this curve is heading towards purpose and away from cheap goods manufactured for overwhelming profit. Our position in support of the motion is that in order to become more resilient and adaptable in the face of adversity in the future, companies will have to become more purpose centric or risk ceasing to exist. Now, to win this, this debate, um, we believe that we have to demonstrate a majority of businesses will become purpose centric, not every single business as this would be an absurd proposition to defend. What do we mean by purpose centric? We mean companies that are looking beyond profit at other goals other than profit. And this of course lies on a spectrum. And on the one hand, you'll find those companies built on the foundation to tackle a societal challenge or climate change. Then on the other hand, we might find companies that have started in a different way and are now embedding purpose by, for example, creating a community around their business. And all of these are equally valid in our eyes as purpose-centric businesses. And within that spectrum, we'll find Patagonia and Danone who are building livelihoods, sustainable livelihoods at every step of the value chain. And we'll also find companies like Interface who have developed a carbon neutral life cycle for all of their products. Ladies and gentlemen, there's three key reasons why purpose centricity is essential for the future. The first one is very simple. It makes business sense. To just to show you an example, in 2018, Unilever's sustainable living brands, which really have purpose at their core, grew 69% faster than the rest of the Unilever portfolio. In addition to that, they represented three quarters of Unilever's growth that year three quarters. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you can see the importance of that. These businesses, or sorry, these brands have created a story and values that co consumers and stakeholders can resonate with and find authentic. Now, second key point is resilience. It just so happens that purpose actually increases resilience in companies. As a matter of fact, purpose-centric businesses have been shown to be up to 30% more innovative than non-purpose centric businesses. And as we all know, innovation is a critical skill moving ahead in the next decade. And finally, I'm gonna to touch upon shareholders because I'm sure 
that my opposition team here will touch upon that. As some of you may know, this Sunday is actually the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Milton Friedman Doctrine, which puts shareholder supremacy above all else in business. Now, while the opposition team may pop the champagne on that day, uh, we want to suggest that there's a growing alternative uh, demonstrated actually over the last couple of years. Last August, a year ago, the US Business Roundtable made a public declaration to move away from shareholder capitalism towards stakeholder capitalism, understanding the impact of their business on every single member of society. And this past January, the World Economic Forum made stakeholder capitalism the core focus of the entire forum. Now, this is clearly demonstrating a trend towards a different way of doing business. Ladies and gentlemen, it seems these days we are in a perpetual crisis, whether it's economic, public health, societal. In these difficult times, purpose puts a flag in the ground creates a North Star for businesses to navigate the challenging times ahead. Purpose is therefore essential for navigating the wicked issues of the coming decade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Saskia. Um, I'll now look to the first speech in opposition with Raborni to open the case for the opposition. Afternoon. Well, we know. This, we are at an economics of mutuality forum. And let's face it, for most of you, this topic is dear to, our, to your heart, as we have seen in the way we have voted in the opening statement. However, we aren't the bad guys here. We are in opposition of the motion, not in opposition to purpose-centric businesses or responsible businesses. In fact, any institution or individual that understands their purpose and their true reason for existence and pursues that sounds like a good thing. But the motion that within a decade, business as an entity would be purpose-centric or cease to exist sounds rather bizarre. There's simply no evidence that suggests that this motion will truly come to pass. The team, in proposition of the motion seems to think that life is some kind of Disney movie, that business will find its prince charming in purpose centricity, that the two will marry each other and run off to live happily ever after, that McDonald's will rise to the occasion and finally champion animal rights and the happy meal will finally be happy. But life we know is not like that. And we here are just the voice of reason. Today, my teammates and I will provide you with insights that will help you vote in opposition of the motion by the end of this debate. I myself will dwell on two points. Firstly, why now? We have had countless of movements aimed at getting businesses to be more responsible over the years. And the pattern is the same. They just reincarnate and come back presenting themselves in a different title, but the core is similar. Do you guys remember the days of social corporate responsibility? Or maybe you're more familiar with ESG, which then gave birth to economics of mutuality, shared value, conscious capitalism, the list goes on. And the point is this, the pattern remains the same. A new idea comes in town, you and I are curious. We point of information. What is this thing? Yes, Saskia. Are you stating that a clear move towards more responsible business is a bad thing? Because this pattern exists and it's showing a direction of, of movement in, of business? Thank you. No, as we said, we are in support of purpose centricity, but the motion will not come to pass, not all businesses and certainly not within this decade. As I was saying, trying to explain the pattern is the same. So we get an idea and then we can become curious. There's the early adopters that jump in, you know, and as the proposition team have mentioned big businesses, what you will notice is that the early adopters are usually companies who are already in a well-established 
industry with good margins that are doing well. So when the opposite, when the proposition team states that the top, the purpose-centric businesses do better than the rest of the bunch, it is simply causation. No, it's simply correlation, not causation. And once these early adopters come to the party, what do we have? We have case studies and finally more and more people join in, but they are met with the same reality that the current market and economic environment were not designed and simply cannot support any form of responsible business. I'll give you an example. You and your office, better yet your division or the whole company can decide that we are championing this course and becoming more purpose centric. However, once you need to go and present to your shareholders and explain why your margins have dropped, that's a totally different uh, story. These returns are tied to people's pensions. We always say lives matter over profit. And I agree, it should. However, let's take the COVID pandemic as an example. When, it first, uh, when the first outbreak hit, governments were quick to say lockdown. Our people's lives are at risk, they all shouted. But soon, as the economic conditions crumbled, they, they all reverted from their stance. And this is not because they are mean or that they do not value the lives of the people, but rather just like the CEOs and the executives, they were held ransom to the fact that the current economic and market conditions as they stand would not allow them to go on. So today we are not against purpose centricity. We are not against responsible businesses. However, there's no evidence that the momentum we have achieved thus far will yield in a total transformation within this decade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravoni, for finishing with perfect time. Um, I will now look to the second speaker in proposition, who I believe is Juan, to continue the case for the proposition. Thank you so much. Even though um, capitalism has opened opportunities and created progress at rates that we have never seen before in history, we believe that one of the critical features of the system has been the unequal distribution of the profits within society and the lack of private interest into participating in the collective resolution of social challenges. As a result, I'm here, I'm here to say that mistrust against institutions, governments, and businesses has reached historical levels as the current purpose of the corporation has not only shaped how wealth, profit, and prosperity are distributed, but it also has altered the core functionality of power, representation, and governance in institutions. Mistrust has then contributed to the erosion of popular support for the free market, leading to a continuous loss of the le legitimacy of businesses, as individuals are continuously stopped believing in the critical role that corporations can play as agents of positive social change. The attitude towards firms becomes then hostile and the basic fabric in which businesses rely starts to become fragmented. Then without a shift in the purpose of the corporation, as we are trying to argument in this debate, this behavior, will, this behavior will continue to be perpetuated in the system and will eventually crumble the foundations on which the modern world is built. In addition, democracy is also altered by the fact that businesses do not ingrain purpose in their uh, strategy. People do not feel uh, represented. They do not feel that they make part of the system. And then they also elect government, um, government leaders that are gonna make erratic, gonna propose um, erratic policies. And this is gonna be harmful for businesses and the, keep is gonna, and the loop is gonna keep going on. For these reasons, Organizations that step up and reimagine their purpose by putting their resources and knowledge to the service of civil society will break up this vicious cycle and protect the system in which they rely on, as we need to take into account that businesses never work in isolation from their environment. The only way for businesses to survive is by putting their expertise and the scalability and the scalability of their business models towards the delivery of effective and sustainable solutions, restoring social trust in businesses institutions and modern contracts of governance and representation. Otherwise, as we are arguing in the, in the debate, businesses could lead to seize their um, 
existence due to the lack of support for the economic, political, and social structures in which we live, as they cannot operate outside of our society, and they must ingrain the purpose in their organizations and in their methods. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your speech. I will now look to the second speaker in opposition to continue the case. Just before Alex begins, I'll remind you that floor speeches will take place after the speech. So if any of you would like to speak in either proposition or opposition, please get some ideas ready. Um, and with that, I'll go to Alex to continue the case for the opposition. Hi, thank you. I'd like to thank the members of the proposition for painting a beautiful picture of the world and its interactions. Hope that one day we can all live in that utopian world. In the meantime, I'm here to talk about the real world. I'm here to appeal to your sense of logic and reason and beg you to let it rule over your emotions. Hoping that business will become purpose-centric will not make it so. Businesses are expected to blindly repeat the mantra, purpose is good for profit. Yet, it's not hard to imagine scenarios where this is not the case. The outcomes of these scenarios are not reasoned through due to naivety or worse, due to false pretense. Let me talk about one of the more common scenarios competitive industries face. It's no secret that to build a credible purpose-centric strategy, a business must plan for the long-term and take all their stakeholders into account. When a business takes this long-term position, it is effectively using resources now that will generate profits in, the several, year, in several years to come. This sounds great, except for a little caveat. These decisions will hopefully benefit society and, and the environment, but what, is, what will your competitor's reaction be? What happens if your competition does not share this altruistic view of the world? This is where things start to become messy. If your competitor chooses to use those resources for short-term advantage, your long-term profits will become no-term profits. Let us recall Unilever's actions when Kraft tried to do a hostile takeover. Giving in to the pressure from shareholders, they did a 5 billion share buyback, increased dividends by 20% and cut costs, resulting in 20% operating profit margin. Not very purpose-centric, if you ask me. Yet, Paul Pullman, the, the CEO then, is not to blame. As he expressed in an interview shortly, we had, we had to make some practical compromises, which I frankly would have not done. Paul's decisions are logical and foreseeable result of the world we live in. For those of you versed in the art of game theory, this scenario closely resembles what is known as a prisoner's dilemma. When designing your strategy, you must also account for the moves of other players in the game. The best risk versus reward position is reached when both businesses choose to compromise with short-termism. These actions are not driven by evil intentions, but rather by human behavior itself. The same behavior which drives consumers to behave a certain way. When you buy a car, do you really re do you research about the purpose of the company or do you tend to choose quality at the most affordable price? Think not what you would hope to choose, but what you would actually would. Nine out of 10 times, the price is the most important factor. This makes, these market forces are so strong and so embedded within us that no amount of pledges and promises will be enough to overcome it. Business will not change. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. Right, we now have the opportunity to make floor speeches. I'll open the debate up to the floor. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand on the Zoom function and I will promote you to panelists in order to do so. Please allow for any technical difficulties in doing this. So is there anybody who would like to be the first speaker in proposition from the floor? It's going to be very awkward if nobody puts their hands up. Right, well, <laughs> there is nobody with their hand up on the Zoom function. I will give you one last chance to do it. If not, we will move straight to the rest of the speakers. Right, well, in that case, we will continue with the speakers from the debate. Um, so I will look towards the final proposition speaker, Peg, for the closing statement in proposition. Thank you for your attention today, ladies and gentlemen. As the final speaker from the proposition, I'll just like to leave you with a powerful quote that has guided me for a long time. And this quote is, nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. Now, the idea whose time has come is purposeful business. It's sad that the only thing is that our position has failed to realize it. 
let me show you once again why history is on our side. Firstly, our opposition has tried to prove that purpose goes against profit because you can make profits in the short term by going against purpose. True, you can indeed do that, but I would argue that short-term profit isn't profit. It's theft. It's stealing from both our future, our children, and the rest of society. In fact, we have increasingly seen that if businesses want to survive and profit in the long term, they need to care increasingly about non-financial factors such as environment, society, and yes, purpose. We assume that the investments in purpose only pay off in the long term, but the opposition has yet to demonstrate that any such principle exists. In fact, we believe that investments in purpose will pay off immediately in terms of attracting consumers, helping you to define a niche in the market and simply be more attractive to your consumers and employees. On the other hand, lack of purpose leads to lack of accountability, corporate overreach, and bankruptcy. Yes, please. The, is your assumption true for every kind of business or are you suddenly talking about successful companies that can, can implement these changes? I, I believe this is irrelevant because we only need to demonstrate that purpose is a, mark, is a way for businesses to demonstrate uh, that they can outperform their competitors, whereas you have failed to do the opposite. Anyway, continuing. As I mentioned, lack of purpose leads to lack of accountability and uh, the increasing cycle of ups and downs and disastrous market crashes that has become so commonplace within our modern economy. Second point, the opposition seems to believe that purpose centricity is somehow not a good way to enter a market. Yet they have failed to see that almost every company nowadays, especially the most innovative and exciting ones, have a purpose embedded straight in the heart of what they're trying to do. Look at Uber. Point of information. Nope. Sorry, please let me continue. Uber's mission is to ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion. Even the fastest growing startup possibly in the world right now, TikTok, has a mission and their purpose is to inspire creativity and bring joy. And yet, look at the opposition. The opposition is that when companies don't put purpose at the heart of what they're doing, they struggle to attract the consumers and the employees that they need. Let's just look at the example of Philip Morris and other outdated monoliths of the cigarette industry. They are actually the ones who have to pay through the nose in order to get anyone to work for them nowadays, simply because their purpose does not align with society, nor have they succeeded in translating to this new purpose-led economy. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps the most important thing that I will leave you with today is, yes, we are far away from where we need to be. However, I refuse to accept that we simply need to sit back and accept the way the market is right now, simply because it's not where it should be. Purpose needs people. It needs me, it needs you, and it needs everyone in this room. And I know that all of you are with me. Why? Because the Economics and Mutuality Forum this year has 2,000 attendees. It's the largest Economics and Mutuality Forum ever. And all of you have spoken to so many of my fellow MBA students this year who have come to Oxford in abandoning lucrative careers in search of purpose. Oh, increasingly on the same page as you, but if we believe that our thoughts govern our actions, we better start putting things into action. It only takes 15 to 20% of true believers to push the system towards tipping point. And although you may not see it now, we are very, very close to where the number of people that we need to actually transform a society to the state that we want, where every business will be led through purpose, where businesses will have to respond to consumers who show they care routinely by not only voicing their views, but also putting their money where their mouth is and voting with their feet and with their dollars. We live in a world of unprecedented information opportunity. Let's not let that go to waste. Let me leave you with one final quote, ladies and gentlemen. And this quote is, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. Who do you think said this? Is it one of the latest visionaries? One of the people who are famous for programming problems in business like Paul Pullman? No, it's Henry Ford. Henry Ford said this about Ford Motor Company way back in the early 20th century. This shows that the idea of purpose-led business is not new, ladies and gentlemen. It is only now that enough people are realizing it for the truth that it is. It's time for all of us to take this idea that is long overdue and use business to transform our societies for the betterment of our children, our children's children, and mankind as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. I'll move on to the final speaker in opposition, but just to let you know that those of you who did decide they wanted to make a floor speech late, um, will go back to floor speeches after the panelists have completed their speeches. 
So with that, I will move to the final speaker in opposition, Jack, to close the debate. Thank you, Beatrice, and, and thank you, everyone, uh, organizers, audience, facilitators, uh, and especially uh, my friends on the proposition uh, for all of your, uh, shall we say, well-felt points. Uh, it's a shame that you're all totally wrong, but uh, thank you for turning up all the same. Uh, we are classmates, uh, and as students, we've learned a, a broad set of skills to help us understand topics as difficult as this motion from uh, mapping complex systems, the dynamics of political economy, the economics of climate change. Our curriculum has been filled with soaring, inspiring rhetoric, logic, and theory. We've even had highbrow stuff like game theory chucked around in this very debate. But that was when we were students. We graduated yesterday. And as I'm sure you can tell by the quality of the proposition's arguments, there are some pretty sore heads today. And we're not students anymore. Now we're just unemployed. And just like all good nights are followed by the cold light of a morning headache, so the rhetoric, the logic, and the theory, it all gives way to the reality. I therefore have the honor as the British member of this debate to rain on everyone's parade. There is no way that this is going to happen in the next decade. I plan to use my time with you today to help bring all of my bright, young, hopeful, and sadly misguided fellow students crashing into the real world populated by all of my fellow grumpy cynics. I will show them and you two things. One, that business will never do this, and two, that we would never want them to anyway. So the first question, will business actually do this? And the proposition have made a number of assertions. I think that we've counted all of them, but just to run through them, uh, we've looked at all of the usual suspects in purpose, the Patagonias, the Danones, the Unilevers. Um, we've talked about everything that they've done. and We've noticed the common thread. It's the luxury of rich companies, really. Um, there have been so many opportunities for the broader business world to do this, and they haven't done one who manfully subbed in for Harry. Point of information. Please. Are you aware that Unilever works intensely with smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and other developing markets to make their lives better? I am, thank you. Uh, so Juan has manfully subbed in to Harry, uh, who was actually so sure he was wrong, he didn't even show up today, uh, and mentioned the, loss of the, the risk towards businesses of a loss of legitimacy and how it's in their interest to win it back. And that this is a long-term play in a short-term world. Uh, it's interesting, actually, that, Saskia, to your point of Unilever, uh, we noticed that at the first sign of any competitive trouble, they were very quick to completely drop their purpose. Uh, we noticed the importance of price and return over everything else with them. And then finally, Peck did a wonderful job of explaining an idea whose time has come and that profit is a theft from the future. Uh, and I loved his use of Philip Morris to articulate that, uh, because if I couldn't think of a better industry for short-termism, winning out of a long-term interest, it's got to be smoking. Uh, I'm sure that if people were thinking long-term, Philip Morris wouldn't have any customers. Uh, and if Henry Ford was able to deliver on some of his purpose, uh, particularly regarding some of his slightly more questionable views on, on Jewish people, then perhaps we wouldn't want him to be able to. So I think it's abundantly clear that this isn't going to happen. But all is not lost, because I would argue that we wouldn't want it to anyway. We'd agree that democracy is the best way to ensure that everybody's voice is heard equally with one person and one vote. But we don't run elections just for the sake of it. We elect people to elect laws and reg like regulations. It follows then that these laws and regulations are our voice. They're how we want our world and our society to operate. So don't you think there's something a little nefarious in the fact that the main parties advocating for purpose-driven businesses are typically the businesses that would do enormously well out of deregulation? A worker losing their arm in an accident is unlikely to say if only my employer was less scrutinized over their health and safety practices. A boohoo garment employee making £3.50 an hour probably isn't thinking, doesn't my employer have a great ESG rating on Moody's? Purpose-driven businesses are nice to have, but we mustn't lose sight of what a colossal piece of misdirection that this really is. We shouldn't be outsourcing our morals, our ethics and accountability to business. We don't want Mark Zuckerberg or Rupert Murdoch telling us what truth is or Jeff Bezos determining minimum wage or taxation rates. The United States just elected a business leader as a president. I wonder how that's going for them. We're staring down the barrel of a climate crisis and soaring inequality across the planet. And these are gonna need global collaboration and regulation, and that can only be achieved at the ballot box with our voices. Yet my friends for the proposition tell me that we shouldn't ask, that as long as businesses outline a purpose, we need not ask any more of them and they'll act in our interest in spite of countless examples to the contrary, from astronomical pollution committed by industries to the 2008 financial crisis and resultant inequality. 
Unilever dropped their purpose at the first sign of trouble and they're considered fairly credible. If we can't trust Unilever's purpose, how could we trust Facebook, Amazon or Fox? This is nothing but a smokescreen to stop you using your voice to demand change. In times like these, we need more democracy, not less. And anyone saying that they can represent your interests better than you should be viewed with deep suspicion. So we know that businesses won't be purpose centric within 10 years. and We don't need them to be. And in any attempt by them to convince us otherwise is just sleight of hand to avoid being regulated. A vote for my team, the opposition, is a vote for this honesty, common sense and logic. If you love democracy and you love freedom, you must vote against the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. So now we will move back to floor speeches because some people have put their hands up now. So I will remind you that floor speakers have two minutes to speak. Um, and that I will look for first a speaker in proposition and then a speaker in opposition. So um, through, with your hands up, I will go to Pascal to speak for the proposition. I'm promoting you to power. Hello, thank you everybody for your contributions and this very flourishing conversations. We are indeed living in times of disruption. Boom, boom, boom. Every day we face new realities and every hour we face new claims on how to best deal with these new realities. And every minute we are asked to navigate in uncertainty. In this world, it's not about learning what you do, it's not about practicing how you do it. To be successful in times like this, you need a North Star, just as Saskia said, to help you to go ahead and when you are alone, to know where is the right direction. And you need to do this without the teacher of the what and without the previous experience of the how. This North Star is the why. And if you understand your capabilities and the need of the world, you are future ready. This applies to cooperation just as much as it does for, for us as humans. And Rebone tonight made a tactical argument and called our side bizarre. For me, quoting Disney doesn't make an argument. She calls 10 years unrealistic, but I say, let's travel back in time and I think back in time in 2010, there was like Cameron president or maybe a prime minister in UK or maybe Brown. But anyways, who would have imagined Brexit, right? But there was the spark of that already there. And now it's reality. And Alejandro said, purpose is good for profit. And I must say, actually, he didn't say that. He said, purpose is good for profit. And I must say, he got a point there. A lot of people hijacked the purpose movement for marketing reasons. But we all know the evidence, right? And I mean, there's nothing uh, in, like we, we, we believe in science here in Oxford, I guess. So yeah, um, thank you. And I believe um, that when we come back to our reunion in 10 years, we'll look at purpose as the new normal and um, we all think, all right, it started back then when we did our MBA. Thank you very much for that speech. Um, I'll now go to a floor speaker in opposition. So Dr. Said, I'm promoting you to pass. We'll do two more speeches after this, one in proposition and one in opposition. Hi, can you see me? Okay, that, that's me. I am in opposition and I'm not in opposition of the proposition. I'm in opposition of both the proposition and the opposition because I personally believe is that uh, a black swan impact has taken place and this black swan is not the first or the last black swan. There will be many more black swans. So what if we compound two black swans together and what happens is a repeat black swan, even without a repeat black swan, we're going to have a paradigm shift. So the Friedman economics will shift towards and economics which is led by identity politics. The value, the worth, the economic valuation, everything will come from probably and most probably, possibly 
an AI dominated spring, an AI spring. In 10 years time, there will be an irrevocable, irreversible artificial intelligence domain. And that will change everything, the way that the economy works right at this moment and the way that politics works right at this moment. Economics and politics, political economy, both will change. As a result, the proposition, although my heart goes in favor of it, it will not work. It will not stay. It will not be there. And interestingly, the opposition, what they have said, that's also correct. But the thing is, they will not have the economics of today. It will be an AI dominated reality. And I just wish that governmentality and the design space is governed, is, 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 uh, is inspired by what a poet said a hundred years back, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by Z into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country and the whole world awake. With that, that's what Oxford is for, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. I'll now go to a further speaker in proposition. It's not possible to tell who from the hands up wants to speak in proposition or opposition, um, but Natik, if you want to speak in proposition, um, I will, could you say so in the chat? If I don't hear anything, I'll go to somebody else. Um, in that case, um, John Saunders, did you want to speak in proposition? Keep your message in the chat. Oh, it's getting messy. No, no. Um, I am willing to. I don't one hundred percent agree with the proposition, but I don't one hundred percent agree with the opposition either. All right. Um, go ahead. So. My speech is, I don't agree with the opposition in saying by foregoing, allocating resources to purpose, you're going to miss out on short-term profits because I think there's an elasticity in what a company can do based on employee engagement and creativity. Companies in purpose-driven, com employees in purpose-driven companies can and will produce much more creativity and innovation. And we've seen that in many uh, instances. And in a very disruptive environment, like we are experiencing now, creative and innovation, creativity and innovation becomes extremely important. Companies that are purpose-driven have been much more resilient in the current crisis. Do I technically agree with all of the proposition? No, because in 10 years, there will be a mix of purpose-driven companies and non purpose driven companies. Do I think it will shift to be significantly more purpose-driven? Absolutely. Because that is the, uh, I think that is the only way companies are going to thrive with the innovation, creativity, engagement, and also, at least here in the US, all the figures I see, millennials are uh, comprised 40% of the workforce and 51% of millennials say what is important to them is the purpose of the company that they work for. So the competition for talent will become intense. The need for innovation and creativity is well established and that will happen to a much greater degree in a purpose-driven company. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to Zeus Chen next to speak in opposition. Thank you. Standing in front of Slate Business School, my heart 
is sincerely for social impact. However, I would like to remind, especially the proposition of our motion, today we are not talking about a purpose versus profit uh, debate. Today we are talking about businesses that are not for profit ceasing to exist in a short time frame of 10 years. Let's start off with a few rebuttals. Uh, while I would like to applaud the optimism and idealism of of the principles that we have learned and has been regurgitated by the proposition. I fully agree with them. However, they have not proven how this will happen within a matter of 10 years. And let's mechanize this a little. How will it actually look like? So within 10 years, how it will actually cease to exist businesses would be by regulation or the market actually uh, kicks and plays them out of the market itself. So let's look at the incentive for the different governments to actually put businesses that are not for profit out of business, essentially. Will they actually be more competitive as a country? What if other countries continue to have a battle in terms of prices? And let's see who actually benefits from cheaper goods. We're not just talking about people who are able, who have the privilege to consciously choose between purpose versus profit, but actually people that cannot afford to, people who actually cannot even afford to put an entire meal on the table. Even if deep in their hearts, they share the ideals that we all have and they cannot afford. So can businesses actually price them out of the market? Is it ethical to actually do so? So now that we have looked at the probability in terms of regulations, we look at the probability in terms of the domestic market as well. So as, as another speaker, uh, floor speaker has highlighted, there will always be a mix of businesses that are for profit and for purpose. While we would like our businesses and the businesses that we contribute to to be for purpose, we should not be so myopic as to completely and absolutely exclude all businesses that are there for very basic function of saying, providing commodities. So say, th take a very minor example especially as the judges are weighing uh, which side actually prevails in this debate. Let's say if I'm trying to buy a cell phone holder, for example, that I'm using right now, and um, it's actually carbon neutral, should I actually uh, buy one that is carbon neutral and actually donates to somewhere, uh, some good profit versus one that's completely carbon neutral? Would consumers actually have their mind share? Would the government, again, going back to the first point, be able to regulate to such a minute detail? So again, taking into account the balance of probability, I am proud to oppose. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Zeus. I will now go to Natik to speak in proposition of the final floor speech in proposition. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Natik Reza uh, from uh, PwC Middle East. I work here in Doha. Uh, so I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the proposition today. And I'd like to point out certain things that the opposition uh, made. And I'd like to, first of all, appreciate their concerns that the shareholder want certain profits for them to continue and uh, uh, continue to operate. And that's why they put pressure on company boards to operate in a certain way. But what I think the opposition is not understanding is that the why, why do they want profits? Because they assign a certain set of utility to the, uh, the, to the profits that they make. And that perceived utility in itself is changing as the world changes uh, uh, in this current day and age. So more and more people are now trying to, uh, are now trying to, uh, 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 are able to attain uh, attach higher utility to perceived purpose perceived uh, uh, to to the things that they bring to the world so uh, the relative utility that they assign to profits and the amount of profits that they get out of any assignment is changing and that's what uh, how the uh, how the, this change that the proposition is suggesting will happen so uh, instead of looking at it from a perspective of companies responding to shareholders in a certain way, they sh we should look at the fact that the shareholders will perceive a different kind of utility set out of the current profits. And they would, they would, uh, they would require uh, companies to, you know, uh, give them better sustainable businesses as well as this utility uh, structure changes over time. And a, a good example of this would be the Black Lives Matter movement that is going on right now. So these are, you know, millennials and young people who, have put their careers at stake for something that does not 
eventually may uh, uh, affect them directly it affects another person but they believe that the benefit of that other person is embedded in their utility curves and that's why they're demanding the governments all across the globe not just in the united states in uh, in 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 uk in australia everywhere all around the globe to do something about it and make sure even at the risk of being uh, thrown in jails to and at the risk of dying at the hand of covid to come out in the street to protest something that they want out uh, something that they want out of the government uh, based on the pur purpose they believe uh, that they bring to this world and that is as these million uh, million and these young people go into the workforce going to the decision making uh, uh, seats in the next 10 years and uh, as they become shareholders of different companies and stakeholders of different companies uh, re requesting those profits or whatever perceived utility they want out of any venture uh, this in itself will drastically change how corporates respond to uh, to their purpose and how how purpose centric businesses become very important and that's that's something that i believe the opposition has not touched on they they continue to focus on the fact that shareholders will perceive the same amount of profits because they won't assign the any additional utility to purpose and what not but that's changing as we have seen people have put down their lives for movement that do not affect them directly and why because they believe in purpose and that is going to translate into business as well in the next 10 years and it will change drastically thank you very much and i will go to a final floor speaker in opposition of the motion which will be harry i'm promoting you to panelist thank you everyone for that very fruitful debate i think a previous speaker was correct in bringing up that ai is a key to unlocking this debate but one of the issues that I feel um, wasn't tackled was the issue of AI and its purpose. I will bring up two main points in my speech in the two minutes that I have. One, AI is a representation of algorithmic bias. And second, the role of AI in replacing the job market and um, making, uh, making it so that people are less involved in these processes of large corporations. I want to frame this topic in my, my speech um, with this first quote. There are only two industries, large industries in today's economy um, that calls the people that use its goods and services as users. Those two industries are nar narcotics and big data. And considering Fortune 500 co companies today, a lot of the huge Fortune 500 com companies are of the tech-based background or big data background. So with that, Let's go into my um, arguments. First, AI is algorithmic bias. This is where the question of purpose-driven companies comes in. We, uh, I'd like to posit that in this, in, this, in this discussion, you'd have to talk about whether AI would be as net utility, uh, po uh, as positive, you're using that AI um, to do something for purpose, or is it for profit? And we see, at least in my opinion, um, because AI is coded by a human being and it is in their nature to maximize profit, the biases that they um, develop to use these deep learning analytics, the, um, all that will be based on them. So you can't say that you will eliminate for-profit companies because it's up to the person to develop this AI technology. Lastly, quickly, um, AI re as replacing human beings um, company culture will now be determined by the person who's writing that code. For all these reasons, I am very proud to oppose. Thank you very much for that speech. And thank you to all of the floor speakers for taking the opportunity to make a speech. I'm sorry about the slight tech chaos. Um, we will in a moment move towards voting using the poll function um, to express our thoughts on the debate, the speakers and the floor speakers. Um, just to remind you, we've heard from six floor speakers and six debate speakers whose names should be included in the poll and that the motion before the house this evening was this house believes that within a decade businesses will be purpose centric or will cease to exist in a moment we should be able to hear some music and launch the poll but until then i will give you the opportunity to collect your thoughts on the motion Thank you. Um, so with that, thank you very much for attending and for voting. The winner of best floor speaker is the first floor speaker, which was Pascal, I believe. Um, the winner of best debater is the final speaker in opposition, Jack. 
Um, and in a stunning change from the beginning, the winning debate team seems to be the opposition team. So clearly they did a good job of convincing you all. Now, thank you so much for attending this evening and for putting up with um, some minor tech chaos. I hope you've all enjoyed the debate and I will hand back to Laura. Huge thanks to, to you, Beatrice, for being our chairperson today uh, and for wrestling the tech uh, so doggedly. Um, and to everyone on the uh, tech team for enabling this most unusual debate to run not too bumpily. Um, thank you to the organizing team for giving everyone who spoke today the virtual floor. Um, so here we close the fifth annual Economics and Mutuality Forum. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>